major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating and air, restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit billhowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening. It's Friday, December 23rd. Thanks for joining us. I'm Amitha Sharma, in for Maya Chabulsi. The holiday travel rush is on tonight. With Christmas Eve just hours away, a brutal winter storm is bashing most of the country. While San Diego prepares for a warm, sunny weekend, San Diego International Airport is the crossroads for travelers coming and going at this hour. KPBS reporter M.G. Perez is there and joins us now live. M.G.? Amita, there have been delays and cancellations here at Terminal 2 all day, triggered by that winter storm that you were mentioning. We should also mention that there have been some travelers fortunate enough to have their flights arrive and leave on time. But tonight, that is becoming less the case. Terminal 1 is even more congested because of the continuing construction all around it. And the airport authority tonight is issuing another advisory, telling San Diegans to avoid parking here on site and show up at least two hours before your flight. Don't cut it close. You can see it in their faces, the worry of reading the flight status board and the disappointment when the reality sinks in. So the flight was supposed to be at 8 o'clock. The, the board says 1130. John Schroeder and his wife Adrian are from North County, trying to get to Terre Haute, Indiana. What's the weather like there? Pretty bad. <laughs> A delayed departure here in San Diego knocks down the dominoes for the connection they have to make in Atlanta. You know, we've got a couple hour layover there. That flight's on time. That's the only potential problem. But I had extra room in my suitcase, so I threw in a couple extra layers of clothing. It's going to be bone chilling. Hanging over all of this are the cranes of construction, which forced the Terminal 1 parking lot to close permanently. So traffic and temperatures are at the heart of the traveling trouble. Negative eight degrees, so, and snowy, so. John Collins and his wife escaped Chicago, looking for a warm weather Christmas in San Diego. Their plan worked. It was just negative 30 wind chill and negative eight degrees as we were heading out. So, uh, so pretty brutal, but happy to be able to put the coats away. Meanwhile, the Schroeders have their heavy coats on, ready for Atlanta and on to Indianapolis, and maybe Terre Haute before tomorrow. Then after that, we have to drive with our rental cars. So probably midnight is about the time we'll put our heads down. So the good news is these travelers made it to San Diego. The bad news is their luggage did not. You are looking at the line for travelers with lost luggage they are trying to get united with. Meanwhile, the congestion problem I talked about earlier, as we were driving in, there were literally people jumping out of their cars and running down Harbor Drive, pulling their suitcases in hopes of making it to their flight in time. So the advisory is serious. Don't cut it close, Amitha. MG, what do the flight status boards look like right now? There are a lot less on-time uh, notifications on that board. We know that about 114 cancellations have happened, and there are about 260 delayed flights uh, at this hour tonight. And guess what, Amitha? Mine is one of them. I've got a flight that was supposed to leave at 815 to Houston tonight. We're delayed at least an hour at this point. And my daughter's is one of them. Thank you for that report, MG. Well, just before Christmas, COVID and flu cases are trending down. That's good news. But the message this holiday season is the same as the others. Protect those most at risk. KPBS health reporter Matt Hoffman has the latest. Last December, the amount of COVID in San Diego's wastewater was spiking up. But this year, officials are seeing a downward trend. We certainly are not where we were last year this time. The county's public health officer, Dr. Wilma Wooten, says we don't know what will happen over the holidays, but in years past, we've seen surges. 
so once we get on the other side of the uh, new year, hopefully, and, and we know hope is not a strategy, but we uh, anticipate that those numbers would continue to decline. Fewer San Diegans are presenting to emergency rooms with flu-like symptoms. Wooten says that tends to happen every year around the holidays, but we're also seeing small declines in the number of flu cases. Again, all good news, uh, but the season is not over. Uh, yeah, we're still in kind of the midst of the flu season. Vaccinations are encouraged for both the flu and COVID, especially those at higher risk. It does take two weeks for people to get full protection against severe illness. If people still have not been vaccinated, we encourage them to do so. That vaccination won't really help with the holiday weekend coming up, but it will help for any other gatherings or activities that people are engaged in two weeks from now. Cases of the respiratory virus RSV are also continuing to trend down. The virus has no vaccine. It impacts young kids, but can also be deadly for older adults. If they contract any type of viral illness, uh, they potentially uh, have a higher risk for complications, just due generally to the fact that they are elderly and they have uh, underlying medical conditions. Masks are not mandated in San Diego County anymore, but Wooten suggests that people put them on in high-risk situations, like crowded indoor areas. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. As with most big national stories, there are San Diego links to the House Select Committee's report on the January 6th insurrection. The newly released report mentions five-time failed San Diego political candidate and former President Trump economics advisor Peter Navarro. Navarro refused to testify before the committee and turn over documents related to the insurrection. He is awaiting a criminal trial for contempt. The report also cites SDSU grad Christina Bob as one of the Trump lawyers who went along with the, quote, baseless and extreme claims of election fraud. And the report notes that San Diego-based One America News Network ran a segment stating that Dominion voting systems had switched votes from Trump to Biden in the 2020 election. The network is facing a defamation lawsuit from Dominion. The House passed a massive $1.7 trillion spending bill just ahead of tonight's deadline for government funding to expire. The bill supports critical government operations and provides emergency aid for natural disasters and Ukraine. It also includes a provision aimed at making it harder to overturn a certified presidential election. The Senate passed the measure yesterday. When people drive under the influence, it's not always from alcohol. The San Diego Sheriff's Department says it's creating a process to test more than 100 intoxicants to determine what's creating danger on the road. KPBS SciTech reporter Thomas Fudge has more. At least half of all drivers arrested for DUIs have more than one drug in their system. So says Jennifer Harmon, director of the San Diego Sheriff's Department Crime Lab. She says blood tests show there are many things that can make someone dangerous behind the wheel. You know, the most common drugs that we find um, in individuals who are stopped um, in addition to alcohol is cannabis, methamphetamine, cocaine, fentanyl. We also um, see Xanax which is a prescription medication. The crime lab has just gotten a million dollar grant from the California Office of Traffic Safety to better monitor a wide range of intoxicating drugs. Harmon says by summer next year, they also want to bring all the toxicology tests in-house to their lab rather than contract them out. Well, the intention of the grant is to provide staff as well as comprehensive testing to ensure that we can test our drivers for a comprehensive list of drugs. With drugs other than alcohol, blood content isn't always a good test of whether someone is impaired. A UC San Diego study published earlier this year showed that about 50 percent of people who had just smoked marijuana were impaired behind the wheel, but their impairment was unrelated to the content of THC found in their blood. So determining whether someone is impaired after using cannabis or fentanyl needs to be done the old-fashioned way, police observing your behavior. 
If the person that they are speaking to, and this person that is then performing the standardized field sobriety tests, if they are performing poorly on that, and if, they're, if the officer or deputy is seeing other signs and symptoms from that person that suggest they are unsafe to operate the motor vehicle, that's when the deputy then has probable cause to arrest that person. Blood testing of an impaired driver often requires a warrant, which can happen if the driver refuses a blood or a breath test. The point, of course, is to get dangerous drivers off the road. A federal study found nationwide more than 200 people were killed in impaired driving crashes during the Christmas and New Year's holidays at the turn of 2020. Thomas Fudge, KPBS News. Tonight, law enforcement agencies are kicking off Christmas weekend DUI patrols. The CHP's maximum enforcement period starts at 6.01 this evening and will continue through 11.59 p.m. Sunday. If you see an impaired driver on the road, you can call the Sheriff's Department at the number on your screen. Title 42, the pandemic era policy restricting asylum seekers will remain in place until at least December 27th. That means many families hoping to seek asylum in the U.S. are spending Christmas at shelters in Mexico. Morgan Lowe reports from a shelter just across the border from Arizona. From the outside, the Kino Border Initiative shelter looks like any other building just a few hundred yards south of the border. But inside, with its bustling kitchen, this has become home to dozens of migrants waiting for a chance to enter the U.S. legally. Estamos esperando. Antonio Martinez has been waiting here for three months. To him and others in this dining hall, going back home is not an option. They can't go back to their places of origin due to the reasons why they fled, mostly violence. Um, and they can't move forward because of the policy. Gia Del Pino works here, and she says the latest delay in ending Title 42 just before Christmas has created anxiety and depression. The idea that the end of Title 42 on, was on the horizon was a huge hope. Um, they were very hopeful, and now, you know, that hope has been dashed. The people who operate the shelter say they are doing their best to create a holiday atmosphere. But the little legs whose feet still don't touch the floor in this image show there are families here. And this holiday will be a tough one. Uh, a lot of donations have come in for Christmas gifts for the children. So we, we give those to the children and their families to just give them a little bit of joy and a little bit of hope. I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight on the news, our recommendations from the final report of the committee investigating the January 6th attack. Coming up at 7 after Evening Edition on KPBS. The CDC says an estimated 48 million people get sick from foodborne illnesses every year. And as Mandy Gaither tells us, a recent report highlights some major changes needed to ensure food safety across the country. It's been nearly a year since certain lots of infant formulas were recalled after reports of bacterial infections. This exacerbated a supply chain caused formula shortage that extended to other brands. One formula maker told Reuters the shortage is likely to persist until spring. Being assured that we have a safe food supply is important to everyone. Dr. Jane Haney chaired an independent expert panel that conducted an evaluation into the Human Foods Program, which is overseen by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, an agency she once led. While the U.S. food supply is generally recognized as safe, Haney says there are three major findings in the report. First, the food safety program needs to be enhanced. Second, the FDA's nutrition program, meant to provide greater access to healthier foods and nutritional information, needs to be built out and enhanced. Finally, the agency needs to focus on prevention instead of waiting for something to happen. More prone to action than deliberation, if you will. The report says connecting FDA technology for better communication is key. Haney says there also needs to be more funding for the human foods program. Getting the adequate amount of funding for this uh, program is just, uh, I've used the word crucial and I'd underscore it again. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. 
As California's years-long drought continues, the state is offering money to farmers to fallow their land. Rachel Wolf explains what it means for the agriculture industry and communities long term. I was excited for a solution. Uh, I was excited for the future of farming and protecting the right to farm. Katie Stack farms 3,500 acres of almonds in Stanislaus County. She is one of hundreds interested in the newly created LandFlex program. It's the, the program that is very unique because it is really focused about wet water, making sure that we have wet water for our communities and for our aquifer and for our ecosystem and our farms. Aubrey Betancourt with the Almond Alliance, a nonprofit trade association, says it's an idea growing on farmers. So it starts by looking at reducing immediately demand next to those watersheds to, to provide that instant relief to protect those wells from collapsing during this dry period. When surface water is short, groundwater demand increases. Farmers and wells have to go deeper, depleting the quantity and quality of water. So the idea is actually just to reduce the demand. So immediately stop the bleed, stop pumping. To do this, the Department of Water Resources is providing financial incentives of up to two and a half million dollars to farmers to fallow fields in areas called critically overdrafted basins. Farmers are identified based on their proximity to drinking water wells that have gone dry or are in jeopardy of going dry. To become compliant and to make sure that we are protecting the water that we do have, that's really important for the longevity of this program. Stack hopes the program plants a seed for sustainability. We have to focus all over the state, statewide, and make this easy implementation for every farmer. Landflex, providing an environmental and financial solution for the agriculture industry in the Golden State. California Ag sets the standard and almond farmers set the standards. We have decades of research of improving our water, improving bee health, right, all of these things. Um, and so I'm not surprised that almonds are leading the way again. Well, here's your weather headlines. We've got cool temperatures tonight. Dry weather continues in a small, a very small bump in temperatures that's coming up. Tonight, I've got a pair of fours for you, clear and chilly. Here you go, San Diego County. You're dealing with Oceanside in the 40s, Escondido 40s, pretty much 40s. Even in Campo, dealing with 45 degrees. Now you're looking at your future cast. You're seeing some clouds, perhaps some low-lying clouds, fog, especially when you're in the Bay Area. You're going to see some rain, but that's making its way most north, like near Eureka. Friday, partly sunny, dry, dry and more mild. You got some snow showers in your higher elevations. Here goes tomorrow's forecast in San Diego County, Escondido, Oceanside, San Diego, Chula Vista in the 70s, El Cajon in the 80s, and then as you make your way into the mountains, you're looking in the 50s. Campo, just below 70. I'll round it up for you. A nice grader. Plenty of sunshine for your Saturday, mild with those temperatures. It's a bit chilly, though, as you head further inland, especially in the desert southwest, looking uh, pretty chilly, too. Coast? Here goes your forecast, 70s and a bit, a small bump from Saturday into Sunday. Then those temps are on the downtrend as you head into the midweek. Inland, a small bump from Saturday into Sunday, and then you're on the downtrend again with some showers for Tuesday. Mountain, a small bump in temperatures, and then your temps are in the downtrend as you head into the midweek too. And desert, we have a small downtrend in temperatures from Saturday to Sunday, but they bounce right back, 77 again, and then downtrend as you head into the weekend. With your PB KPBS forecast, I'm Michelle McLeod. This season's Spirit of Giving has extra meaning for some San Diegans. KPBS reporter Jacob Bear says one of the region's toy drives is bringing gifts right to people's doorsteps. Tis the season for family, food, and gifts, but not all San Diegans are able to afford the cost of the holidays. 19-year-old Lamar Kennedy Jr. decided something needed to happen. Me and my team, Lion Maid Entertainment, got together and we decided to do a toy drive this year for, the, uh, for Christmas for less fortunate kids. They dug into their own pockets to buy a wide range of gifts and then got some more from some local organizations. Then they put them into some customized toy bags for kids of all ages and delivered them right to people's homes. Sometimes people don't have rides. Sometimes people 
wait in line for a long time just to get one toy or a toy or sometimes people run out of toys and people have been waiting out there all day so this year uh, we just wanted to make it special. And Spring Valley's Erica Lewis and her two children were some of the dozens who got the specialized gift bags. She says the generosity is especially meaningful this year due to rising inflation and a tragedy in their family. Well this year especially because my kids lost their father back in August. He was murdered so this is definitely a blessing for them. It'll put a smile on their face for sure. Kennedy lost his own father back in 2014. Uh, he was an entrepreneur. He was murdered in his business. But uh, growing up with entrepreneur parents, they always taught us to, you know, be ambitious. And when you get in a position to where you're blessed and you can give back to give back. So uh, just taking that negative and turning it into a positive, that's what, that's what we're doing here today. Kennedy Jr. says they promoted the toy drive on social media and got a bigger response than expected. They were able to provide the toy bags for roughly 80 kids throughout San Diego County. He says next year they plan on doing an even bigger event with the help of other organizations. Jacob Ayer, KPBS News. Tracking Santa on Christmas Eve is a tradition for families around the world. And a San Diego company makes sure every kid can see or hear exactly where Santa's sleigh is. Interpreters Unlimited translates NORAD's Santa tracking website into seven different languages. Volunteers at virtual call centers give updates in Spanish, French, German, Italian, Portuguese, Japanese, and Chinese. Someone was able to wake up with a brighter smile and be a little bit happier knowing they knew where Santa was delivering their gifts. Yeah, that's, that's a neat feeling. Last year, Interpreters Unlimited answered around 1,000 calls in non-English languages. Marvel's Spider-Man turned 60 this year and was inducted into the Comic-Con Museum's Character Hall of Fame. KPBS Arts reporter Beth Accomando takes us inside an exhibit celebrating Spidey's legacy. The exhibit is open through the end of the year. Spider-Man turned 60 this year, but the iconic Marvel superhero will forever be ingrained in our pop culture consciousness as a teenager. One of the things that Stanley and Steve Ditko kind of stumbled into, I think, was when they took the concept of the teenager, which was relatively a new concept, even, you know, in sociological terms, and decided that they could turn the superhero into an allegory for that pain of, of being a teenager. And I think that that has persisted through many, many versions of Spider-Man, that he remains the superhero who is relatable precisely to the degree that he's misunderstood, that he's insecure, that he tries to do the right thing, but it isn't always recognized that he's done so, that there is no reward for being Spider-Man, and yet he continues to do it. I think a lot of people empathize with and respond to that. He was, he was kind of a kid. He was youthful, and, and I felt like he was, even then, I recognized that he was a pretty relatable character, and like, I wanted to be Spider-Man. I wanted to put on that suit and swing around the city. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, does whatever a spider can. You can relate to and admire the opportunity to climb up walls and swing over the city mm -hmm. and shoot webs out of your hands. Right. There is something just really innately uh, just amazing about Spider-Man. Comic-Con Museum goes beyond amazing with a new exhibition celebrating the popular web slinger. The exhibit was co-curated by Ben Saunders and Patrick Reed. We have 60 years worth of pop cultural material to draw upon from across pretty much every available media platform. We are very conscious of the innate power of the museum medium to tell stories. It is based around historical artifacts objects, original comic book art, film props, but then we also use all sorts of modern techniques, lighting, projections, high definition digital canvases to tell the story in a more kinetic way. Sometimes telling that story involves peeling back the curtain to look at the creative process through the original art that was used to create the comic books. It's production art. It wasn't originally intended for display. It's the hand-drawn originals from which this whole world-spanning franchise comes. There's an aura around that, those objects. Knowing that this started with the work of an individual with a pencil and a piece of Bristol board. I find that phenomenally moving. Those are the pieces that I always want to stop in front of and spend more time with. But visitors may also be drawn to the photo ops offered by life-size statues. I'm standing next to one of my favorite pieces in the whole thing, because we've never brought him to life in, in any, like this in any way. This is a one-to-one, -one, if he were real, 
this is exactly how big he'd be. Spider-Ham represents another amazing thing about Spider-Man. Any one of us, including a pig, could be him. Some of that comes back again to that key idea about design. A mask that covers the entire face, that was a genuinely unusual design choice for the superhero genre in the 1960s, but it allows a different kind of imaginative engagement. There is an entire Spider-Verse that has been spawned out of that, right. and it is a character that, it is a blank mask. You cannot see any facial features, so he could be anyone. He's like us, but he has this extraordinary element on top of it. Some of the genius of Stan Lee and Steve Ditko in creating the character was that anybody could be under that mask. Uh, it could be any one of us, regardless of color, creed, religion, sexual orientation, whatever. It could be any of us. And any of us can learn from Peter Parker about what we want to be and to stand up for in a world where things not only go wrong, but often are wrong. It's something that is built into the Marvel Universe since the 1960s. In particular, Stan Lee's position against bigotry, against racism, um, that was an absolutely and sincerely held belief, which he wanted to inject into the story material from at least the mid-60s onwards. Whatever life holds in store for me, I will never forget these words. With great power comes great responsibility. How much better off would we all be if there were more people in the world in positions of power who understood that some responsibility comes with that role? It's a good message. Spider-Man Beyond Amazing reminds us of that message. It'll also make your spidey senses tingle with its marvelous look at the legacy of an iconic character. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org. Thank you for joining us. I'm Amitha Sharma, and have a great evening. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating and air, restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit billhowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. And by viewers like you, thank you.